Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the second keynote for the uh, Network Learning Conference this year. Um, it's a real pleasure and an honour to be welcoming um, Steve Fuller as our second keynote. It's, it's quite. A, Actually, it's quite hard call introducing someone of the kind of stature of Steve Fuller because you don't really know where to, where to start or where to stop. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, um, I'll do my best. But, uh, Professor Steve Fuller holds the August Comp Chair in Social Epistemology um, at the um, University of Warwick, where he's based in the Department of Sociology. Um, he's the founder of the journal Social Epistemology and the key figure in that field. Uh, he's, I did a, a bit of a publications count, which made me feel hugely inadequate. He's, a, he's published 21 books by my count. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. Yeah. Um, okay. On issues, fields, and visions, which I think all intersect interestingly and differently with this, our area of network learning and digital education, whatever terminology you are currently using. So he's published, well, I'll just read you a few of his book titles, because that'll give you a sense of where, of, of, of the kind of stature of, of Steve as a scholar. He's published The Philosophy of Science and Technology Studies with Routledge in 2006, The New Sociological Imagination with Sage in 2006, New Frontiers in Science and Technology Studies with Polity in 2007, the Sociology of Intellectual Life with Sage in 2009, and Humanity 2, What It Means to Be Human, Past, Present and Future with Palgrave Macmillan in 2011. I could go on, but I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, so Steve is a fellow of the UK Academy of Social Sciences, and he's a member of the Euro Academy, European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Um, he's also one of the most compelling speakers I think I've ever heard, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing him speak this afternoon about... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the title of his lecture this afternoon is The Lecture 2.0 or Why Academia's Future Depends on Broadcasting the Brand. Um, Steve, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, first of all, let, let me thank uh, everyone who was involved in inviting me here. Um, this is not necessarily the most natural place for me to be, but then no place is ever that natural for me. Um, in case you don't know who I am, I'm, I'm someone whose original training is in history and philosophy of science. And then once I moved to this country uh, 20 years ago, um, I, I moved as a professor of sociology, and that is pretty much as I have been since then. Um, but my main concern has been uh, in this field uh, that was uh, briefly alluded to in the introduction, which is social epistemology, which has to do with the social foundations of knowledge. Okay, um, And I'm typing up these terms in the board. I don't mean to pat be patronizing, but if you've not heard of this stuff before, I might as well mention it uh, explicitly. And so the idea here is um, to be interested in the way in which knowledge is not only produced but distributed uh, and not just be interested in it from an empirical standpoint, because we have a field in sociology called the sociology of knowledge, which deals with that, but, but, but the normative perspective, namely, where should we be going f uh, with this? Uh, because it's quite clear that if you look at the history of media, uh, starting from writing onward to the present day, that in fact we, uh, we do have all kinds of ways of binding together the thoughts of people in a public publicly accessible manner that can be transmitted in lots of different fashions. And in fact, you might say that part of what the history of the modern period has been about is accelerating that in some way, right? So in other words, we've been able to bring together larger and larger uh, uh, sources, uh, more sources together, uh, and, and be able to distribute them to more people. And these people have been better equipped to be able to receive those sources and to do more with them. And this is the sense in which it's reasonable to talk about the modern era as a knowledge society. Okay, So all of that is true. Um, and I don't want to belabor that too much. Um, and, and so then we enter into this kind of situation that we've been in since the end of the 20th century, where uh, we got to start to wonder, OK, what differences uni do universities make? You know, What's the point of having a university? right? If everything is a knowledge producer, Right, and we're sort of very comfortable with that kind of idea. Uh, then, what is the difference that a university makes? Okay, now of course universities are very old and resilient institutions. They've been around for whatever uh, you know since the uh, 12th century. Um, but the question is, maybe they've passed their sell-by date. They don't have anything really very distinctive 
Uh, and if the best you can come up with in terms of justifying the existence of the university is that it enables you to bundle together things effectively or efficiently, right, then that may pass itself by day two, right? Because that is not, in fact, how universities have been traditionally sold as institutions. And so in a sense, this is what the talk is about. I'm someone who is on record very strongly as being very much pro-university as an institution that needs to survive. Okay, And, and I believe uh, in a fairly classical notion of the university, in fact. Um, and, and this is the idea that's associated in the modern era with uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt. And I'm sure some of you know about him. And this is the idea uh, that uh, what the academic is, is this uh, person who, as it were, transmit their, the, transmits their research through teaching, right? There's this kind of integration of teaching and research, right? And this is something worth putting forward to students. So this is, a di this is quite a distinctive notion, OK? And, uh, and, and there's a sense in which we lose sight of this kind of ideal at our peril. Because prior to Humboldt, and so Humboldt is writing in the beginning of the, eight, of the 19th century, right? In the first decade of the 19th century uh, is when he is the uh, minister for higher education in Prussia. Uh, he is a person who is very much influenced by the writings of Immanuel Kant, who is normally seen in the history of philosophy, at least, as the person who managed to transmit the conception of the Enlightenment to the universities. And this was an innovation. I think this is worth pointing out. This was an innovation, what Kant did. Because the Enlightenment was a movement prior to the early 19th century that existed largely outside the universities, right? Where all the interesting intellectual action was occurring was outside the university. You know, if we're talking about the Industrial Revolution, right? Or we're even talking about the Scientific Revolution, which had been taking place since the middle of the 17th century, most of the people, it may be true that in some sense they were university trained and perhaps had contact with people who worked in universities. Nevertheless, these people had no particular affiliation with universities and were generally complaining about it. Right? If they want to really expand their horizons with regard to what knowledge could provide for themselves and for society at large, they were somewhere else. Okay? And so the great contribution of Humboldt, and this is what the modern university is about, is somehow incorporating the Enlightenment spirit within the university, an institution that had already existed right, for over 500 years by the time we get to the period he's living in. Okay? So he created it as a dynamic institution. Because look, at the beginning of the 19th century, the university was primarily a place you went to, tre uh, to, to train if you wanted to become a priest or you wanted to become one of the learned professions where then you'd had some kind of quasi-political role, basically. You'd be able to manage people or manage land or something like that. Whether you were in theology, you'd manage the spirits. Okay? But you'd be managing something. And there was no general expectation that this particular institution you would enter into to get training would empower you to become an equal citizen with other people in a society at large. This is one of the great contributions of the modern university system that begins with Humboldt. And part of this had to do with the fact that Humboldt was in Prussia. Okay? And so Prussia was very much a kind of subordinate nation. Right? It wasn't like England, which already had the massive sort of you know, trade arrangements taking place and so forth. It wasn't like France, which already had a kind of very well-established nation state for about 200 years, even with the French Revolution. Right? Prussia was, in a sense, a, you know, a kind of backwater. I mean, in fact, one of the consequences of the, of the reestablishment of the University of Berlin in 1810 was to put Berlin on the map. Right? And, and, you know, and from the standpoint of when we talk about the development of German culture and so forth, that becomes very prominent over the course of the 19th century, so that Germany is, in fact, the premier scientific country of the world right? at the, uh, at the uh, uh, advent of World War I. Right? This is a product of the modern university system. This is something that occurs over the course of just a century, okay? overturning all of the other places that had a kind of advantage already from the past. 
Okay? So this was a very powerful kind of idea. Okay? And it had to do with the idea that you would actually have an institution that would actually encourage people not simply to repeat the past, not simply to pass on tradition, but rather would innovate. Innovation would be incorporated into the structure. Okay? Now this is a very interesting kind of idea. Okay? Uh, and um, here I think it's worth pointing out, because when we talk about corporations today, right, business firms, things of that kind, I, I think it's quite natural to think of these things as being in the basis of, uh, you know, being in the business of innovation. But uh, universities are actually the first thing that actually get dedicated to this, and I think it's worth pointing out that in Latin, the legal term for corporation is universitas. This is the term that's already been used in the 13th century. Max Weber makes a big deal about in his sociology. Um, and the idea here is that we, you actually have, as it were, uh, an institution that is, that is self-organizing. Okay, So in other words, uh, it is not just something created by something else, right? and has a life of its own, and has purposes of its own that go beyond just the lifetimes of the people who are involved. And so churches, city-states, citizenship comes from this kind of idea of the, of the universitas, okay? So in other words, that there is a life to this thing, and, and, as an or, and as a kind of larger collective organism, there is a kind of dynamism that's natural to it to keep it alive. So each, you know, just like we have to replace ourselves in our body, each generation we have to be replacing people to be able to carry this sort of social organism forward. Okay, and so universities were chartered in exactly the same way as churches were chartered and city-states were chartered. And, you know, we talk about this term, you know, cities are incorporated. This is kind of what we mean. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a reminder of this kind of older medieval notion. And so then the question becomes, um, you know, if, we are, if, if in a sense, as part of a university, we're participating it, in this dynamic organism, what exactly are we trying to do? Are we just trying to maintain ourselves? Right, because this is the idea of just tradition repeating itself, which was kind of the original way of thinking about it. Or in some, in some sense, are we, th are we thinking about a kind of evolution, a kind of development that the, that the organism, the social organism can undergo, which in turn can be kind of a catalyst for the rest of society. And this was the idea that Humboldt had in mind with the modern university. Okay? So the idea here was that you would actually want people, right, who when they brought in the students would actually catalyze and enable those students once they have matriculated, right, to be able to go out and actually to increase and to foster the society. This was a very important idea. Um, now, the interesting thing, I think, from the standpoint of the issues that are of concern to us here in this conference, um, is that the lecture was incredibly important. Because I know nowadays, especially for people in your community, like the lecture is this kind of obsolete thing, you know, that in some sense can be very easily replaced by MOOCs and stuff like this, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But actually, this is the soul of this kind of modern university uh, that uh, Humboldt was on about, uh, and which we still defend, often without kind of understanding the, the full spirit of the idea. And I think here you have to um, go back a little bit to what exactly was this idea of the Enlightenment. What is it exactly? Because, because look, I think if, um, you know, before the 18th century, when the Enlightenment really sort of took hold in Europe, um, and you were, let's say you were transported, you know, do a little time traveling, go back to that period, and you people all equipped with all those network learning skills and technology and stuff like that. I, I, I think a, a, lot of the, um, a lot of the people back then would have been quite comfortable with what you were doing because the whole point of what you were supposed to be doing when you were uh, in a university was just transmitting knowledge effectively to the next generation who are then going to rule. Right? So it's just kind of a, you know, it's, it's a very mechanical kind of process in a certain way. 
right? Namely, look, you know, we've got the established forms of knowledge, Aristotle, the Bible, whatever, right? And we just reproduce this because these are the people, this is the kind of knowledge you need to keep on governing the world pretty much the way it was governed before, right? And it's in the 18th century that you start to get with the Industrial Revolution, I think primarily, uh, this idea that actually there are alternative forms of knowledge, alternative ways of being that can in fact give better direction to the future of society. So the universities start to be challenged on those grounds. In other words, orthodoxy is not good enough. Repeating the past is not good enough. Just getting the stuff across accurately and reliably is not good enough. Okay? So what is this other thing that you need? This is the interesting question, right? Um, and the thing about the Enlightenment, and again, you know, it, this is where it's always worth you know, reading people like Kant and all these other guys from the Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment, Voltaire, Rousseau, all these people, uh, is uh, the Enlightenment was very much about not simply manufacturing knowledge in the sense of every generation is simply repeating the past and being a vehicle and so forth, but rather that each individual is, an, I, I, as it were, is able to think for themselves, make decisions for themselves. You know, so in other words, they learn certain things, but then decide, no, nah, this is crap, this is good, you know, and then I move forward appropriately. The, I mean, when, when Kant is very famous um, for, for this phrase that is an, in, in an essay that he uh, wrote at, toward the end of the uh, Enlightenment called What is Enlightenment? Right, dare to know, right, make judgments for yourself. Now, so there's an interesting question of how exactly do you prepare people to make judgments for themselves, to dare to know. How do you do that with each generation? Uh, because, I mean, I think one of the things that's very clear when you get to the early 19th century, and in this respect, it's not so different from now, right? Um, people are beginning to realize market economies are here to stay, right? There's going to be a lot of changes going on in the world. Already there are revolutions happening across Europe. A lot of the established hierarchies are being disrupted and things like this. And if you are an establishment institution, an institution with a long history, that by itself is no longer going to give you legitimation. You are going to have to say, what kind of people are we preparing for the future? A world that is going to be very dynamic, a world that's always changing. I think this is exactly what Humboldt had in mind. And moreover, he had this additional issue, namely, he was in the nation building business. OK? So in other words, if you want your nation to be very prominent. How should you have the people who are getting the cutting edge forms of knowledge, how should you teach them to think how to be? And the question is, how do you do that? It is not a matter of bullet points or telling them to read certain books or anything like that. It is about the sort of person you are. Okay, and this is where the lecture comes in, about what is valuable about the lecture. Because look, what's valuable about the lecture uh, at least in the, in the sort of conception that I'm presenting, and I think you can already tell, I'm very supportive of this conception, and I think we lose it at our peril, right, uh, is that it's not about the reliable transmission of information. There are many more ways of doing this, and especially if we're talking about a literate culture, you know, a culture where people have, you know, ways of, as it were, getting more um, fine-grained, detailed understandings of things through multiple media and so forth, Right, in a sense, the lecture is not competing with that, okay? And the, certainly the lecture is not competing um, with people, uh, as it were, trying to, uh, you know, respond to what they're learning, because obviously the lecture, to a certain extent, is a very authoritarian institution. There's no doubt about it in a certain way, right? I mean, in a sense in which the lecture is telling you something and you're listening, and that kind of asymmetry, of course, goes against a lot of our norms about learning and so forth that we've developed now. But what the value, the value of that asymmetry, and this is a um, point that I want to stress here, is that it, the lecturer, if the lecturer is good, and this is where the universities have to think about the kind of people they hire to be their brand leaders, right, uh, is that it's some, someone who can exemplify in their practice this kind of daring to know. In other words, you don't want to have a bionic textbook. Right? You don't, want to have, you don't want to have someone whose content is reducible to their PowerPoints. Or where you, you know, because you've been to lots of lectures, right, where you say, oh my God, I, you know, if I just had the PowerPoints and just read the article, I wouldn't have to put up with this bullshit. Right? 
If that is your response, then that per the person you're responding to has failed in the enlightenment mission of the university. Because, I, I mean, and this, I think, has, you know, if we go back to the original German context, okay, because, you know, we live here in the Western world, you know, we live in this era, you know, in this uh, place of free speech, free expression, all the rest of it, okay? But if you go back to Prussia in the early 19th century, and indeed, until you get to the Weimar Constitution after World War I, when Germany first, for the first time becomes constitutional democracy, there is not the generalized right of free expression uh, that, that in the Anglo uh, world that we take for granted. Okay, I think that's a very important point here. Um, and, and, and so what, what free expression meant, right, in the Prussian context, right, was a very precious kind of thing in a way. Right, which gave you a certain kind of obligation, that the sort of people who were entitled to free expression were you know, responsible for thinking through things. And as it were, looking at many different things that are on the table, many different options, many different opinions, and then reaching a judgment for themselves with the understanding right, that if you're a student, you might be in this position some, someday as well. And this is a very responsible position to be in, because not everyone's in it. Okay, And frankly, I think if we thought about free expression more in this way, it would actually be respected more. This is not to say I want to stop free speech or anything of that kind, but I do think that this is always a very important point when one thinks about um, the early context in which academic freedom, this great concept, academic freedom, was promoted. Academic freedom was originally a guild right. It was a distinctive right of professional academics because they were in this kind of privileged position to actually look at all the stuff that's out there and make judgments about it. And the expectation was that the academics would, in fact, decide different things in different classes. And that's why you should go to different lectures. And you, as someone who has the benefit to actually be in the audience and listen to these guys, right, that you are forced to make a decision yourself. And that is how you train yourself to be free. Because freedom is not something that is innate. It is something you have to learn. And then the question becomes, what is the appropriate learning environment in which to be free? And this is what the concept of academic freedom was about. Okay, And the lecture was very important in this regard, because you would expect that the lecturer would make discriminating judgments about things. They wouldn't just kind of say, OK, here's, you know, Blah 101, here are the basic concepts. This is what everybody in my field agrees, you know, and I'm just going to run through this. And then I'm going to, you know, we're going to do a little bells and whistles exercises to make you feel good about yourselves, right? Rather, what I'm going to do is I, I may tell you what the basics are of the field, right? Of course, there's not, you know, one should do that. But then I'm going to say, ah, but you see, this field, there are some real problems here, guys. And, and I don't agree with this, and I don't agree with that, and I'm going to give you my reasons. Now, you may disagree with me, but these are my reasons for doing it. Now, even if you disagree with the lecturer who's speaking, nevertheless, you get a sense of what you need to do if you want to be part of this business. Okay? And again, I think the way in which Humboldt and the people who supported the Humboldtian University um, we're, we're, we're thinking about the university was, in a sense, it's a bit like an incubator, right? An incubator of freedom. What does it mean to be free, right? It, I mean, again, I mean, this is something we so easily take for granted in this world, right? Where we have this kind of notional no, uh, idea of free expression, and everybody is presumed, you know, because people are literate and they can interact with the internet, and, and we've flattened the channels of communication and all this kind of stuff that in a sense, everybody's got access to everything, and so we're all free in that sense. No, being free is actually a sort of very special kind of skill which involves discrimination, right? And being able to defend judgments that one makes based on a lot of sources, right? All of whom will have authority, and they will conflict with each other. And you just take that as given, and so then your responsibility is to sort it out if you're in a position of authority. Okay, that is education for freedom. Okay, that is so important. And, and this is the context in which I think it is important uh, to think about what the value of the lectures are and, and how lecturing as a kind of um, 
art form of the university ought to be promoted. Because of course, I mean, most of the things that we see nowadays on MOOCs and ever other places as lectures, not always, not always. And I'm happy to say I was included in the Edinburgh MOOC, you know, uh, and I certainly wasn't doing that kind of, you know, economics 101 style stuff. Um, but, but I do think that, that you know, the, the market, and this is what's worrisome, right, is that the market for a lot of the um, network learning stuff where you have people giving lectures who, let's say, are these, you know, you know, these primed Harvard guys who are giving you the, the, the orthodoxy as it's seen from Cambridge, Massachusetts, right, is that in fact it disables the th sort of thing I'm talking about, right? Because other universities eff effectively just delegate out, you know, saying, well, look, these, here are these better universities where these people are giving these kind of authoritative forms of knowledge, and just listen to that, pass the exam, and everything will be okay. What the message is of that kind of sequence of thinking is actually to kill the Enlightenment. I don't care how much information you're providing. The spirit in which it's being provided is not the Enlightenment. It's something else, and you may consider it valuable. I'm not denying it's not valuable. I'm not denying it's useful. Of course it is for the kind of world we live in. But if we're thinking about the Enlightenment, where what we're trying to do is to train the next generation of people to be leaders of the societies that they're part of, and to take that society into times where we don't quite know everything that's going to happen, that it's a failure. Now, of course, there's a great economic model for uh, this thing that I'm decrying, because, of course, if we've got lifelong learning, then you always have to come back for more. You always need more lectures. You always need more MOOCs. You always need more things. You've got to top up, right? Top up my knowledge base, you know? Uh, and there'll be a lot of, a lot of big market for that, too. But that's not enlightenment. I'm not saying you don't need to do that. Because obviously, as the world changes, new skills, new knowledge is required. But that is not the enlightenment notion of the university that makes the university a distinctive institution. OK, that's the key point I want to say here. I have nothing against promoting knowledge that's useful, promoting knowledge that's instrumental. But we don't need universities for that. And, my, and the more that universities compete in that market, the more likely they're going to lose at least in particular markets where other providers with narrower horizons will succeed. Right? Because universities, in a sense, are competing in multiple markets at once at the moment. Right? And it's straining all the resources, and people don't know how to operate and so forth. And this is where it becomes very important, I think, uh, and the smart universities already know this, what is the core value? What's the core message? What's the core brand? that the university is trying to promote, OK? Um, because look, if what you want to do is transmit information effectively and efficiently on a regular basis at an affordable price, you really don't need a university. What you really need is, as it were, prospective employers or some other external agency to accredit you. You just need a, an accrediting agency, a credentialing agency. You don't need a university. So you could have just two entities existing in the world. You could have the entity, perhaps yourselves, you know, providing the mechanisms by which people get the knowledge they need. And then you have this other entity that tells you, yeah, you know, you're producing good knowledge there. And it's the kind of knowledge you need to get these kinds of jobs, which your students want to do. If that's what you're doing, OK, you don't need a university. No need for a university under those circumstances. OK? Um, and of course, again, this is why I say if you go back before the Enlightenment, before the 18th century, right, where such a large percentage of the university population was being trained for the priesthood, right, you've got the churches validating the knowledge being taught in the universities. And if they weren't teaching it the right way, they got, you know, shoved out. OK? So you got, you know, so the universities were just basically, so in this, this is why I say, for those of you working in this area, if you were to go to the period before the Enlightenment and talk to the, the people running the universities before the 18th century, they'd, you'd find a friendly audience, I think. Yeah, yeah, we do need to get that Christian message along much more efficiently. There are all these kinds of conflicts and competition. And, and you guys might be able to do it for us. But what you're not going to have a conversation about is, tr is, is teaching, figuring out how to teach people how to think for themselves which is what the Enlightenment ultimately was about. Now, um, but how much more time do I have? Um, we've got another two minutes. OK. 
Um, now, I also want to say something about, in a way, the material conditions that made the Enlightenment possible, because I think this is very much part of, uh, well, not only part of what we're about here, but also part of, a, a part of the way I'm presenting this talk. Um, and here I want to talk about improvisation. Okay? Um, I don't know how many of you know uh, of the of work I've written. I, as you as pointed out in the introduction, I've written all these books. I, obviously, no one's read them all. Um, but but one, um, one small book uh, that I published about 10 years ago is called The Intellectual, okay, with Icon. It's still around. Um, and, 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 uh, and there's another kind of more scholarly follow-up book called The uh, Sociology of Intellectual Life with Sage. Um, and, and one of the points that I stress in both of these books um, is that part of the persona of the intellectual, who basically, for purposes of this discussion, uh, I identify with the Enlightenment individual, uh, is the capacity to improvise. Okay? And I want to say a little bit about this uh, process, which uh, I'm sure you know, some of you have, may have run into if you watch stage performances of uh, you know, actors, comedians, people like this. Um, and, and I think this was also very much essential to the way in which, um, in the original German academic system, um, knowledge was transmitted, not simply from the standpoint of trying to make the points clear, but from the standpoint of giving a certain kind of image of what it's like to think publicly, right? To think in public, right? And to think in public is not to read a script. Okay? That's the first point, right? It is not to read a script, and PowerPoint's cheating. Okay? Um, and so that's one point. But the interesting thing about improvisation, from the standpoint of the history of uh, performing art, is, of course, improvisation uh, presupposes the existence of writing. Right? You, do, you can't really talk about improvisational cultures unless you've got text that you can then, on the basis of which, say, this guy's improv improvising. You know, so if you have read all of these numerous books of mine that were alluded to, you might be able to think, well, you know, some of this stuff he's saying, he said this before. Right? But I'm not reading it from a script. Right? I'm sort of thinking it out loud to you as I'm speaking. OK? Now, I think this is really going to be an increasingly important skill for academics in the future to exhibit their powers of thinking for themselves. Okay? Um, because I think at the moment, one of the, one of the problems I, I, I see with, um, it, it's, it's not just, it's not a problem. I mean, I think problem is too strong a word. Maybe it's kind of a challenge, you might say, is that we're able to record more and more of what we're actually doing. So if you end up doing the same thing twice, Someone's already got it. It's probably intellectual property at your home university. And you can't do it again yourself without being sued by the person who owns the intellectual property. Right? And so there's going to really, and I, I do think this is where we start to get to the issues of the future of jobs in academia and so forth, right? If you're the sort of person who has perfected a very mechanical way of presenting things that is very accurate and very reliable, right, and has no surprises and does exactly what it says on the tin, Right? You are going to be replaced. Right? Really, you are going to be replaced. OK? See, back in the old days, right, uh, in order to know whether you, in fact, had uh, done things you know, accurately, reliably, comprehensively, all the rest of it, you needed sort of discriminating judges in the audience to make judgments about you. But now it's all out there for open display. Right? And there are lots of, you know, and, and the point, and, and by the way, this, whole, this sort of idea began already when we got written textbooks. Because here was the thing, right? I mean, in the, in, in the origins, if you go back to the Middle Ages, right, to the origins of the university, and you look at lecture, right? Lecture comes from the Latin legere, to read. But what was reading back in the Middle Ages was reading out loud, because basically what you had, if you were in the audience, right, is you as students don't have any texts. You are basically writing what I'm saying, and what I'm doing is I do have a text, but my te I am commenting on the text as I'm speaking it. So I'm getting you to write the book 
that you don't have a copy of and you can't buy in your bookshop because they don't exist, right? You're writing it down and you're also writing what I say about it. You're putting them all together, okay? And that was the origin, the origin of the lecture was that kind of process, right? So there was a lot of active learning already presupposed in that process, much more so than we, I think, give credit for, okay? But then what happens once we get written textbooks? What happens once we get everything being recorded and filled and so forth, right? People start to get lazy in this respect. Right, they say, look, I can get the knowledge from elsewhere. You know, I don't need to go to the lecture. I don't, you know. And of course, the lecturers respond similarly. Right? They, they, they see their audience disappearing, and, and they, don't, they don't respond to it in a proper way. There's another thing, and this is the big elephant in the room, um, is the fact that you know, this Humboldt story I was talking about, one of the reasons why it's been threatened isn't simply because of neoliberalism and all these awful things that are said to be destroying the university, but it is actually part of the development of the university itself. And the idea of research and teaching being disaggregated from each other, right? Uh, to my mind, within the academy, those of you who are very much involved in the academy, this is the big problem to actually renewing, reviving this kind of enlightenment ideal. Because as a matter of fact, you know, if you think about the sort of people who are uh, doing uh, uh, PhDs, and, 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 you know, and PhDs are still a degree that primarily you would do if you want to pursue an academic career, um, you're not taught how to teach. And in fact, you, know, you are taught basically that teaching is this kind of penance you have to perform in order to do the PhD. Right? So don't spend too much time on it. Don't let it get you down. We've got all these ancient notes that you can use to sort of force feed your students, right, and all these exams that we have on record and all the rest of it, right? And so the idea of having to translate your research into teaching is considered a kind of minor annoyance rather than an essential part of the task, okay? And if, if you're taught to communicate at all if you're a PhD student, you're, you're taught to communicate with other PhD students and other people who have PhDs, right? So the, there's a sense in which your ability to communicate is very much marginalized within, and this has a lot to do with, you know, when we talk about the specialization of knowledge, the division of academic labor, all this stuff that has, you know, grown very much apace uh, in the end of the, uh, you know, World War II, um, this is what we mean. And what this has essentially done is to gut the concept of academic freedom as a notion that can be exemplified in the lecture process. Okay? Because now we've got a situation where students come in, they're taking a course, you know, they're expecting basically a kind of repetition or watered down version of the textbooks that they've been assigned or whatever they've been assigned, right? And if they don't go get that, they actually complain. Um, and the academics themselves kind of reciprocate by thinking, oh, these people don't really want to be here. You know, I'm this kind of boring nerd, you know, who unfortunately has to earn a living by subjugating these people to my voice. You know, um, you know and, and, and this kind of relationship, you know, and so in, it's in this kind of environment, in the live environment, if the live environment is like this, there's no surprise, you know, that, that some very super sexy guy talking about the banalities of Economics 101 coming from Harvard, right, can end up scoring a million hits, right? It has nothing to do with academic freedom. It has nothing to do with pushing the boundaries or of anything. It has to do with the fact that everybody's expectations have shifted at, in, in, in the context of the research and teaching functions of the university disaggregating that there is no point to actually give a great original lecture. Because look, from my standpoint, again, going back to the notion of improvisation, right? A great lecture is, in a way, like a piece of jazz. Right? Uh, and I think one of the things that's very interesting, if you look at the history of improvisation, let's say within music, right, is improvisation starts to be recognized and valued once you know, sheet music starts to be available. People start to be able to read music. Okay? Uh, and so the idea then, and, and this is where you start to see in the 19th century in particular, the rise of the great virtuoso performers, right? The guys who can take a very sort of common theme that's familiar from other places and run all kinds of riffs on it, and then yet nevertheless get back to the original theme. You know, you think about, you know, I mean, the, the person who uh, historically, in terms of, uh, you know, who really did this very well was uh, Franz Liszt, in, in, you know, the Hungarian pianist, right? One of the great uh, 19th century musical people. 
who wasn't just a, and he's very much kind of actually that sort of a, an iconic figure for what it is to be a virtuoso, right, doing these amazing things to common themes and all the rest of it. Well, this is what lectures were like, okay? Lectures were very similar to this in the early 19th century, very much to this kind of thing about musical performance. And that's the point I would keep in mind. You know, so you read guys like, um, again, you know, and, and this has a lot, this, this resonates very strongly with me because of my background in philosophy. You know, when we look at the German idealists, you know, so, so the people after Kant, the generation after Kant, we're talking about, you know, Hegel and Fichte and Schelling and all these sorts of guys, right, at the, who were the people who the University of Berlin hired in the first generation to exemplify this kind of enlightenment model. When you read their text, they're very dense, they're very difficult to understand. You know, you can't, you know, it's very hard for us to imagine now how those guys, you know, actually had the kind of influence they in fact had. Right? Because if you just stick to the written text, but the written texts, right, were just kind of a sort of a, a template, a kind of model. And then the whole point was going to the lectures and hearing how they riff on them, how they develop them. Right? You know, uh, and, and it's how they made those things alive. So the writing was, in fact, meant to be very much like lecture notes might be, right? Very compressed, formal kind of things. But then what really mattered, what made a difference in terms of going to the lecture, right, was to hear this thing exfoliated, right? You know, and actually see it being enacted, being performed, and so forth. And there's some, you know, very famous painting, I forgot who did it, of Schelling addressing an amphitheater at the University of Berlin. You see all the seats are covered and everything, and you're thinking, wow. Wow, he must have been saying something other than what I'm reading in this text. <laughs> but in fact, what he was saying was a kind of development from that. Okay, so so I mean, one of the things that is that was I think very much appreciated with this kind of culture of improvisation, that actually made the lecture such a powerful medium for academic communication, and not just a powerful medium, but the branding medium, right? The great universities had the great lecturers, right? That was a very 19th and early 20th century thing. People would go to universities to hear these people speak in the big halls. They didn't go to seminars. I mean, the, the little seminars wasn't the really reason why people went to universities. They went to hear the great people speak. OK? And so what is it that these people were doing? OK? And it was this. One of the things I think that they really understood very well was the difference between writing and speaking as media of communication. And that writing, in, 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 you know, in the strict sense, could be very technical, very difficult, very obscure, not meant to be orally presented, but rather something to be looked at, studied, you know, gone over again and again. You got the pages so you can flip back and forth. But what the, what the lecture was, the speaking part, was to actually make the key points really vivid for people, to motivate them to actually do the hard work that they need to do. That was the point. And this had an enormous amount of effect Right, in the German-speaking world, because I can tell you, you know, uh, coming from the United States, the whole um, you know, educational system uh, in, in the, in the uh, 19th century and early 20th century very much modeled on Germany. Very, a lot of Americans went overseas and were very impressed with this kind of system. Okay? And they all acknowledged, of course, that the stuff was very, the texts were very hard to understand, but they needed to go and hear what the person had to say. And they would come each day and hear because they didn't, they didn't know exactly what was going to be said. And, and, and again, for those of you who follow any kind of German philosophy, you may know that in the, in the last, um, I guess, 10 or 20 years, uh, a lot of Adorno, you know, uh, Theodore Adorno of critical theory fame, uh, a lot of his lectures have been transcribed and translated. Right? He gave a series of lectures when he came back to Germany in the late 1960s, um, and they were in all kinds of... Uh, topics, you know, in sociology and metaphysics and aesthetics and all these things. Um, and, and the thing that's really interesting when you see the transcription of the lectures, which, you know, to a large extent apparently were improvised, okay, so they're not, they're not, trans, they're not translations of notes, but they are, as it were, you know, the translations of the transcription, um, how lucid they are and how a lot of the stuff that is very difficult and very compressed in the writing is in fact much easier to understand in this form. Okay? Now, it seems to me that this is the value added 
right, of a university in terms of trying to convey, not only convey difficult knowledge to make it clear to people, to make it something, though, make it something that they can take seriously, something they, as it were, incorporate as part of their being and want to take forward. I mean, because after all, you know, it was through the lectures of Hegel, you know, who is often regarded within philosophy as the most obscure and difficult writer in the world, that you end up getting all of these people so amazingly inspired by him, and you get Marx and all the rest of them. I mean, what's going on there? Are these people just deluded? No, there's, a, there's clearly a sense of a difference, right? And there was something about the personality of how the information was conveyed and the spirit in which it was conveyed, specifically that you want to convey it as an example of someone thinking for themselves. You see, and this is going to be the tricky thing to convey, it seems to me. But at the end of the day, when we talk about you know, how to brand the university in this kind of age where there will be so many competing ways of presenting material that everybody thinks is relevant to know to get wherever they want to go in the world, this is going to be the key thing that still will need to be preserved if the university is going to survive as an institution in the coming century. Because otherwise, if all you're interested in is cutting edge research on the one hand, or all you're interested in is the kind of knowledge you need to get jobs, then there will be other ways of doing this much more effectively that will not involve universities. And as long as there are credentialing agencies that say so, then universities will be in trouble. But it's this one thing, the idea of the lecture, as, the, as, as, a, as a way of exemplifying what it is to be someone who thinks for themselves. That is the thing I think the university really needs to preserve. And I think this is the challenge for people like you, because I do think that there's a sense in which what is the appropriate kind of technical knowledge one needs to enable this to happen and be promoted in a way that can actually enable your universities to kind of put, it, put themselves forward in this very complicated market in which we live. And I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Shelby. Thank you very much, Steve. That was fantastic. We've got, um, we're running a wee bit late, but I suggest we take 10 minutes to, um, to, to grill Steve, because I'm sure there are loads of questions buzzing out there. So Steve's going to field his own questions, and I'll stop the questioning 10 minutes from now, OK? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, OK. I fully agree with you that very uh, central aim of the university is for, uh, for uh, the people who go to the university to learn to think for themselves. My question is, why do you think the lecture is the best way for them to learn that? A part, and, I mean, of course, seeing an example of somebody see, uh, thinking for themselves is very important. But I would also think that the experience of thinking for yourself and being confident on for that, so that a more dialogic way of acting with your students would be even better than just the lecture, I mean, or, or at least in combination with the lecture. And I think most of us here are actually not concerned with dissemination of knowledge. We're concerned with how to uh, enable, how to, with technology, enable nice ways or, or good ways of having dialogue between teachers and students for, for the students to learn how to think for themselves. Yeah, but the thing is that they still need to learn how to think for themselves at the end. Um, and I guess, I mean, of course, part of this older picture was uh, still a kind of image of, a, of the university as a relatively elite institution, where in a sense, uh, what you're really, what really the skill is about that you're trying to observe in the lecturer is being to stand up against opponents, right? So it's like being in parliament, right? I think that's the kind of image of what it's like to speak to people that's kind of being presented with the idea of the lecture, where in a sense, um, you, shouldn't, you should assume that there are going to be other people in the room who are equally strong-minded and will push you back. You know? And so then there's an issue about what exactly, how many reasons should I offer and so forth. And the idea is that the lecturer, as someone who's quite seasoned in dealing with colleagues and dealing with objections from many different fields, will in fact, in a way, give you a good sense of, let's say, how many reasons do you need to provide? You know, how thorough do you need to be? How should you be thinking about something? Um, so uh, in a sense, I mean, I don't object to what you're saying. But I, I, I just think that the, there is a problem that if you start from the standpoint of people who don't already know how to think for themselves and are somehow trying to learn it collectively without any clear steer, that, that, that as it were, they're going to end up setting the standard too low. Yeah, well, can I ask that? Sure, go, uh, it's okay with me. I don't, you know. Well, I'm just not putting it up as an either or, where I would say what you would want to do then was to train them in thinking for themselves. So you'd want to give them a role model, but you'd also want to have sessions where they weren't just. Of course! No, no, of course, I don't object to that. I, I, certainly, if you, what you want is both and, sure, I don't object to that. 
But it still does require that there be some kind of model that they're looking at in the first place. Yeah, or throughout. No, no, but again, see, because I, see, I actually see the university in this kind of classical ideal uh, in, as very much under threat, actually, from all the various ways in which inf information can be distributed and transmitted. So it does become important if we think about what is the brand of the university? What is it that the university is actually trying to convey that's distinctive? I really think pushing it in this idea of, well, we actually have people who know how to think for themselves, and they'll do it for you publicly. I think that, I mean, that, that would be kind of where I go, because I actually don't, so even though people are very well informed now, more than they've ever been before, it does not necessarily follow that, that they really are very adept at this. this. This gentleman in the back. It's really interesting that you're kind of still clutching to the notion of the oral lecture as a way of demonstrating thinking for oneself. You know, in this kind of modern world, can't we demonstrate thinking for oneself in a much more kind of complex way that involves a combination of oral delivery and the use of technology? Sure, of sure, of course. Okay, but I, see, here's the, the value of oral presentation, and I think this does go back in a way to sort of the theological origins of the university, is the issue of accountability, right? In other words, I can't be a ventriloquist. I'm the one saying this stuff. Don't blame it on my PowerPoints. Don't blame it on my visuals, right? Because one of the problems with the whole multimodal approach can be that, as it were, responsibility for what's being conveyed gets distributed so far that no particular thing ends up taking responsibility for it. Okay, and I think that's a real problem. But, but how do I know you're not an actor? How do you know I don't, I'm not a what? An actor. An actor. No, but it, okay, but the point is that's that's a good confusion to have in a way. <laughs> that's a good confusion. No, seriously. I mean, see, look, when when I am trying to perform the idea of, of of being able to think for myself, you know, you know, and 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 on, you know, in my own terms. It doesn't matter whether I actually believe what I'm saying, OK? And I do think that this is a very important point here. I mean, I'm, Max Weber, if, you've, if you know Max Weber, the sociologist, right, he did this very famous lecture toward the end of his life that was given to graduate students, Science is a Vocation, and about what it is to actually you know, be an academic, what, what kind of a person you are. And he was very much against the sort of people who in the classroom would, uh, as it were, just tell them what the truth is. Right? Just tell them what it is. And this is what you should believe. Because that doesn't exemplify the relevant skill. Right? What re exemplifies the relevant skill is actually showing judgment, which means you weigh, you measure. And in fact, from the standpoint of the students you're dealing with, and this is where it is like an actor, you have to understand the audience. And so you may want to undersell certain things and oversell certain things, knowing the prior dispositions of your audience. OK? And that is part of the craft of lecturing, too. Yes, sir. I'm interested in, you said the material conditions that allow the enlightenment. So you can think of things like the Royal Society and peer review and so on. So what sorts of things would you point to in relation to networks and digital technologies that enable academic freedom to re-articulate itself? Well, um, I do think one thing that is uh, kind of interesting is that our notions of um, Broadcasting, I mean, broadcasting was part of the title of this talk. And I do think one of the things that's happened with the, the ease with which people can get access to different, to, to uh, you know, things like YouTube and so forth, is that everybody's now an information provider, OK? And I do think that there's a sense in which universities could be a bit more adventurous in competing in that kind of market, OK? So in other words, people who are really, you know, exemplary lecturers, you know, on certain kinds of topics, there should be an active promotion in that kind of medium. In other words, you know, it's almost like advertising. Okay? So I, I am very open to that kind of way of, of doing things. I think there's a problem at the moment that universities are still retaining too much of their sort of old-fashioned views about how exactly they publicize themselves. And when they do go into advertising and marketing, it's often in the most kind of piddling and, and very unprofessional kind of fashion. But I actually think a really strong push where you're actually advertising the university's virtues uh, would, would be something that would be wor worth pursuing. Uh, you know? And I do think this should influence, actually, the way people are hired, to be honest. 
And this is where I think I get into a lot of controversial ground, because I do think being a good performer is very important in academia. Okay, because you, as you know, if those of you who are very familiar with university culture, you know that acad academics have a very kind of uh, uneasy, if not negative, relationship to people who are good performers, no matter what their track record is, largely because of the issue that this other gentleman was raising, namely, do you believe what you're saying? Is, are you just an actor? You know, this kind of, you know, it goes back to Plato, right? Plato and the ion, the dialogue, the ion, and all this kind of thing, right? Um, and and um, I do think, nevertheless, that that's kind of going to be the way to go. There's going to be a certain showbiz thing that universities, as part of the branding exercise, are going to have to get much more energetically involved. And the people who want to be academics are going to have to become trained up in this. But the other side of that is production values. I know, exactly. No, I agree. I agree. I agree. It is showbiz. And showbiz. So production values are very important. The OU, despite the clip and ties, their lectures were viewed by many people who now went to the OU. But it requires some institutional support to I agree this, with this 100%. No, you're absolutely right. No, no, there are so many different levels. And frankly, I think people who go uh, to film school um, and, and, and are very much into the, that part of the creative industries, they should go into academia and they should really, as it were, raise our standards. You know, both people who are on the financial side, but also people who are on the directorial side. I agree 100%. I think if we had more, quote, Hollywood values and Hollywood funding, which is the point you're getting at, um, that yes, things would be, I think, you, but, the clear, but the point, see, there's nothing wrong with that kind of move as long as the universities are very clear what it is they're selling. And that's where I think the distinctiveness of the university becomes very important. Because quite obviously, there are a lot of other competitors to universities that are providing knowledge that also have production values and things like this, and, and, and they would steer things in a totally different direction. So it requires both. You see what I mean? And this is why, uh, the reason why I've been stressing kind of uh, this kind of lecture business is because I think this is, this is where we, when we get to what the brand is of the university, what makes it different from other things. But I agree with you 100% that this is how should, it should be backed up. Oh, we stop here? Oh, sorry. OK. <laughs> OK. Thank you.